I hope I'm coming through. Okay, looks like I am. Um, amazing. Welcome to my session, Learn to Build for Mobile. Uh, my name is Lima Tasman, and I am on the mobile engineering team at Replit. So I'm going to share my screen. I have some slides, and we're going to also look at a demo. All right. Everyone can see that? Cool. Um, well, I am super inspired after Amjad's keynote, and there were a lot of cool announcements. Um, I think we all heard about the take replit with you part. Um, I will talk a bit more about that later in my talk, so stay tuned. Um, today, we are going to learn how to make our web apps delightful on mobile devices. And uh, this is a talk for any uh, level of web development. So if you're a beginner or if you know a little bit, this talk is for you. Um, let's get into it. So making websites delightful on mobile devices is a little easier said than done. And that's because mobile browsers have a lot of quirks. For example, there are layout rendering differences between mobile and desktop browsers. For uh, On mobile, we have to think about the keyboard. And you can also pinch to zoom, and you can pan around. And this can cause uh, unexpected changes to our layout. So we have to be aware of that. Unfortunately, uh, there are inconsistencies between common mobile browsers. We have to take into account both Android and iOS and handle them differently at times. Of course, we're dealing with a much smaller screen real estate. And there will be hardware limitations. So we have to be mindful of uh, memory, CPU, uh, network bandwidth consumption. Uh, so we can talk for hours uh, about the solutions to these problems. Um, but for today, I'm going to focus on a few key techniques around usability. So at the end of the session, these are the key takeaways. Uh, first and foremost, keep it simple. Um, this is a lot easier said than done, but we'll go over some of the intuition behind that. The next step after that is um, keyboard handling. So handling the keyboard um, is very important. It's a part of making your app feel very solid. And we'll look at some techniques for that. Uh, the next level after that is consider adding gesture-based features. And this is going to take your app up a notch and make it feel a little bit more native. Um, and finally, you can use Repla to test and build on device. It's going to make your life so much easier. And we'll um, see that throughout the session. Um, so I will pause after each section to answer any questions you have. So please use the Q&A um, tool. And then I'll hopefully leave some time at the end for any questions, um, but let's get started. Okay, so I am going to use this little web app I built um, to explore these concepts. Um, you can also check it out ideally on your phone. It's replicon2022.replitlima.repl.co. And I'm going to switch to demo this on my phone. So let's hope live demos work for us today. Um, one moment. OK, I'm sharing my phone. Hopefully, uh, nothing embarrassing comes up. OK, so let me very quickly show you the app. Again, it's a very simple uh, idea. It's called Daily. Um, and this is an app that lets you record moments throughout the day um, and then uh, play them back when you're going to bed and you can reflect on how your day went. So I've added a little bit of stuff already uh, to, my, to my day. I have a cat who's very needy, so I had to attend to that. Um, and then I can also at any time add what's happening now. So I will do that for the session. Um, let's see. 
look ma i'm at replicon all right i'm gonna add and that adds to my log so we'll check in a little bit after uh to see how the day went um so this is the app and uh, i'm going to switch back to the presentation to talk about the takeaways okay so rule number one keep it simple um, this rule is going to really solve all our problems right um, but what this really means is uh, we want to think about the mobile use cases, the mobile first use cases for your app, and really think about um, what is the essence of what you want to provide to the user that's on the go or using their mobile device. Part of keeping it simple is resisting the temptation to also be too clever to overcome some of the constraints we talked about. Um, you know, we don't want to overload our web app with lots of floating elements and a lot of complicated transitions. At the end of the day, the best thing to do is to keep it simple. Um, now, I am reminded of this quote, constraints breed creativity. And I really believe in that. So keeping it simple means paring it down and it might feel like we're sacrificing something, but the way to look at it instead is you're really pushing your creativity. What can you really do that's fun and delightful um, that is still not overcomplicated? So keep this in mind um, as you work on your project. All right, the other thing is, um, let's get into something more tactical. So when you are um, starting your web app, the first thing you're going to do is add this meta tag, um, which tells the viewport that you want to render the uh, render your website at the width of the screen size of the device. Um, most frameworks that you use will provide this out of the box. This is important. Um, it's up to us then to make the experience adaptable and responsive. Um, if you don't include this, what will happen is the browser is going to infer the width of your content. And if it thinks that your content width is bigger than, de than the device, it's going to shrink the content down. And if it thinks that the content width is smaller than the device, it's going to zoom in your content. And you might have seen some websites that aren't mobile optimized where you see everything, but the font is so small. Um, that's, you know, not usable. The going back to some design principles, um, the other thing we really want to think about is minding the thumb. So uh, for mobile, we are using our thumb as really the main pointer um, and the main thing that's um, experiencing the, the app. On desktop, we have the mouse and we have the keyboard, which are much more precise instruments. The thumb is not. The thumb is sort of a blunt instrument. So when you're thinking about the layout of your web app, you want to keep it streamlined and think more like a kebab and not like a bento box. Nothing against bento boxes. I love bento boxes, but for mobile, we want to think more like a kebab. Um, don't be afraid of letting your content scroll. Vertical scrolling is easy. We're, we're used to that now. Um, so the other thing you want to make sure you're doing is um, have your interactive elements be nice and fat for the thumb. So, you know, per, have a really good height, um, have ideally um, maximum width for those elements so that you can use the site, whether you're left-handed or right-handed. Um, okay. So I'm going to pause there. Any questions about how to keep it simple? OK, good questions that we will get into right now. 
Oh no, the REPL is too popular. <laughs> okay, well, hopefully it'll come back in a second. Okay, let's move on. Uh, keyboard handling. So the keyboard on mobile devices, I like to think of as our finicky pet. Um, it's something we need, it's something we love, it helps us accomplish tasks, but if you don't do things the way it wants it, it's going to eat our shoes. So um, what matters is just sticking to this protocol, making the necessary adjustments to handle the keyboard, um, and then everything will be all right and our pet is gonna love us. Um, so let's get into some specifics. Um, this is a really easy rule to follow, but it's not often, um, it's not well advertised. You want to stick to a minimum font size for any input element you have on the screen. So text areas, text inputs, um, stick to 16 pixels. This is something that um, became a convention through the iOS Safari um, engine which wanted to make sure that font sizes were accessible. And if you are much smaller than the 16 pixel font size, it's going to zoom in and make sure that the font is at the scale of 16 pixels. And that will kind of jigger your, your layout in ways that you don't necessarily want. So I'm gonna jump into the app and show you what I mean. Okay, so we're back to the app. And here I have, um, so the app is built with Svelte, which is a UI framework. Um, what I like about it is it um, compiles to very uh, basic JavaScript and HTML, so we get to keep a lot of the conventions. Hopefully it'll be easy to follow along. Um, so I'm here in my component add note editor. This is the component for adding um, for, for showing you the text area. This is the component here, text area. And if I jump to my CSS where I've set the font size, I'm using 1.5 REM, which um, is another way of saying, um, how, is a way of scaling your font sizes to the default body uh, size, which in our case is 16 pixels. So I can basically um, use pixels as well. So let's say I changed it to 14 pixels. Okay. And then I'm gonna jump back into the app. Okay. Whew. I didn't get the uh, ripple and available problem. Okay, so see what happened? My layout immediately zoomed in. And now I can sort of zoom back out, but by default, what's happening is the ad, uh, you know, a major control like the ad button, it gets cut off screen. So this is an iOS specific uh, feature, but it's a good rule of thumb to just apply it um, universally. So if I go back to my code and I change this back to uh, 1.5, so 16 plus eight, so I'll use pixels this time. Okay, and then I go back. We should not have that problem. Cool. All right, so now the layout did not get readjusted. So that's great. Okay, switching back. All right, the next thing we're gonna, we're gonna um, ramp it up a little bit is um, another important thing you wanna make sure you're doing is adjusting to the viewport changes. So um, modern browsers now provide an object called the visual viewport. And this is basically an object that tells you the visible dimensions of the screen, taking into account the keyboard. Um, if you're not using the visual viewport, you're actually measuring against the layout viewport, which is the um, initial height of the document. So if you've ever used VH viewport height, 
uh, dimensions, that's going to be based on the initial layout, not the layout when the keyboard is up. And unfortunately, when the keyboard is up, it causes some funkiness. So this is actually really easy to do. Um, in your um, JavaScript, you can just listen to this event called resize. And whenever it fires, you can grab the viewport height and then set that viewport height to your root element on the page. Um, and let me jump into um, the demo again. OK, so here's what I mean. Um, let me use a background so that we can see the difference. So I'll use green. OK, so let's go back to this page. Um, so green is this is telling you this is showing you what the um, full um, full root element is taking up. Um, when I dismiss the keyboard, you see that the whole screen is still green. And when the keyboard comes up, you sort of see for a moment that um, the box is smaller, but it still fits within the 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 new um, the new uh, visible height. So what happens if I remove that logic? So let's go up to my code. So here we are. Um, pretty much the same as a snippet. So I'm going to, let's comment this out, comment this line out. OK, I think that looks right. So we're still listening to resize. We just won't do anything. And let's see what happens instead. OK, so let me demonstrate this again. OK, so now the height is just going to be hugging the contents of the um, the elements. And if I dismiss it, nothing happens. But what about when you start to type a lot and it overflows? So let's try that. Um, OK, let's create a poem on the spot. This is a poem. OK. So now, because the height is um, set to this initial height, the overflow is very small. OK, so if you're in the situation, you might, again, try to use um, viewport height units. And I'll show you what happens when you do that. So if I go here, and so here I'm using um, height 100%, as we just saw. What this does is it says, I'm going to use the height of my parent, but my parent doesn't have a height, so I'm going to um, actually fit to the contents. And instead, we actually want to use viewport height uh, by instinct. So if I do that, OK, now it's starting to look sort of right. This is what you know we would initially want. But what happens when the keyboard comes up? You get this ugly overflow, right? And not, not only that, if I sort of keep typing, we don't really see what I'm typing. And that is not, um, you know, that's not uh, very comfortable for, for us. So instead of using viewport height units, I recommend adding this little bit of JavaScript and setting here, I'm using 100% as just a default. Um, but I recommend setting the height to be explicit based on the viewport. So I will just uncomment this out. And we'll get our beautiful, correct um, height. And I'll remove the background. Cool. OK, we're learning a lot today. I'm going to switch back to the presentation. Um, any questions about keyboard handling? Let's see. Lima, there are a few questions. I don't know if you want to wait till the end to answer them. It's up to you. 
Let's see if there's a quick one I can answer. You should see them in the Q&A. Ooh, okay. Yes, these, um, yeah, we can publish these slides after the session for sure. Um, as for this question, hamburger nav bars for mobile are okay to have on the top right. Um, I would say by now it's a, it's a very common design pattern. So I think it's a okay, but there will be some interesting, um, again, some of those inconsistencies in how browsers handle fixed, um, elements will, um, will cause some situations that you wouldn't expect. So, um, on iOS, for example, it doesn't respect position fixed if the keyboard is up. Or if you um, scroll, uh, when the keyboard is up and you scroll down, it's actually it's going to try and move the layout viewport as opposed to the element that's in focus. And the hamburger menu can go off screen. And that can sometimes be confusing to users. So in general, stay away from too many fixed position elements. Um, if you just stick to the hamburger nav bar um, and that's the only one, that's totally fine. And users will expect to see it in the top, somewhere in the top corner anyway. Okay. Um, and challenge for the audience. So another piece of this that will make, um, make uh, keyboard handling even better for users is being able to actually scroll the text area to where the cursor is placed. Um, so if you um, if you write that long poem like I just did and then dismiss your keyboard and then click on the keyboard again, um, it will focus the text area. But if you've chosen to place a cursor somewhere below where the keyboard would come up, um, it doesn't automatically scroll to that. So there is a way to do it. I want to give you the opportunity to try and um, hack that together. And if you do, you'll get some extra credit from me. Um, OK, so last uh, major thing I want to talk about is um, how to add gesture based features. So this is really where now that we've built a really um, simple but thoughtful application, and we have all the solid um, functionality in place. Now's our chance to add some whimsy and add some fun and make the web app feel a little bit more native on mobile. So it's actually not that um, scary to do. Um, there is a very well supported touch event um, that all major web uh, mobile browsers support. And the way you can plug into that touch event is these four events, touch start, um, touch move, touch end, touch cancel. And they pretty much sound like their names. Um, normally, I recommend that you add an event listener to you know, a specific element uh, for touch start. And only when the touch start event triggers, add the other, uh, add the, um, the other three uh, touch events. That way, you won't have too many events registered on the document. Um, that can cause a lot of weirdness. It can be a performance hit. This way, you'll just be listening to the specific node um, in question. I will show you, uh, maybe you, you have already seen this, but I will show you um, how I added it to the web app. Okay, my phone keeps falling asleep. <laughs> okay, so if you go to the app, um, so what's happening now? I am showing gestures. Cool. OK, so if you scroll all the way up, you can actually start to swipe on an individual item. Um, and ooh, let's see. Uh, it's too popular again. OK, well, you can swipe on a, an individual item. It doesn't do anything yet, um, but I wanted to just show it to you so that you can add um, something extra that would be really cool if you're swiping on one of those items. For example, you might be able to swipe and delete the, you know, delete the log, or you can swipe and 
make it a shareable snippet. There's all kinds of possibilities, but here's how it works. So I'm going to jump into the main app file, app.svelte. Lots of setup here. Um, so here's a component. It's called Note. Here we go. And um, each of those items is a Note component. Then if I jump into Note, it's basically a div. And there's a lot of uh, a lot of different events um, attached to this. This is a bit of a Svelte um, syntax, but the main thing I want you to um, to see here is there's um, these events on drag start on drag move. They map exactly to those touch events I showed. And then what I'm doing is when uh, when I start dragging, I add a little bit of logic to make sure. It's not too sensitive. So if you're scrolling vertically, we don't want it to, um, to start reacting. Um, just a little bit of, of a threshold. And then from the event, I'm taking the delta dx, the delta of the um, on the x-axis, and applying it to this value called x. Y, I don't touch because I'm only swiping left and right. And then all I'm doing with it is applying a transform. So um, in CSS, you can use transform translate, and that lets you um, shift the element um, on the x, y axis. And I'm just applying it to a pixel value. So the delta that you're moving is changing the uh, translation of that element. And that's it. And what's really cool is, and let's see if I can load up my REPL. I can't, uh, not yet. Okay, that doesn't work either. <laughs> um, it just automatically feels alive and tangible, um, which is really cool. Okay, we're in the home stretch. All right, so touch events are awesome. They only work on um, uh, mobile devices or touch devices. Um, definitely try them out. Okay, and then as I mentioned, you can use Replit to build and test on device. We just did that. Um, and it's a great way to um, very quickly launch and launch and deploy where you're building and switch to it um, without any configuration. It's just really great. Um, cool. So our key takeaways in the session were keep it simple. It's easier said than done, but um, you're going to be much more creative um, when you do this, really push yourself. Um, handle the keyboard, super important. It's like our finicky pet. We love it, but we gotta uh, do what it wants sometimes. Um, consider adding gesture-based features. It's not as scary as it sounds. And then you can use Replit to build and test. Okay, so I'm just gonna check the Q&A if there's anything here, um, but I do want to Ooh, okay. Got to fix the form link, and I will do that. Um, so at Replit, we um, are always thinking about how to help you shorten the journey from idea to product. And in general, um, as you know, Amjad's story um, has been told through the keynote, we just want to make it easier and faster for you to build cool stuff. Um, so I'm excited to... Oh, one, one last thing. So please fork my REPL. Um, you can do a better job than I did with this app now that you know how to do it. Um, please publish your um, new and improved daily app to community with the hashtag REPLCon. OK, <laughs> so back to what I was saying. Um, I'm excited to announce that we'll be launching a Replit native app uh, for later this year. And it's going to be designed from the ground up. So um, I did see in the chat, um, we mentioned the PWA. This was something we released uh, earlier last year. Um, and it just takes a mobile web experience and makes it available to you through the Play Store. 
we want to completely reimagine the app using those principles, right? We want to keep it simple, but we want to think of mobile first use cases. Um, we want to make it delightful and uh, feel tactile. And um, these are the things that are going to be included. So you'll have easy access to your REPLs on the go. We're going to have a redesigned mobile editor. And um, not only that, we're going to have all new beginner friendly and mobile content that comes with the app. So very exciting. And um, we want to partner with you all to make it better. So if you can join the beta, I'm going to fix the link. Um, let's see. All right, um, the, the link should be fixed. So please try again. If you join our beta program, um, you will have early access to the Android or iOS app, depending on your device. Um, please fill out the survey, help us know, you know what we should be um, optimizing for. And we're super, super excited to involve our community as we build out the native app. All right, let me uh, make sure that everyone has access to it. Is it still not working? It should be loading for all. Hmm. Try, uh, if you're still seeing you need permissions, try refreshing. Might take a little bit for Google to propagate the change. But try refreshing. Oh, still asking for permission. Hmm. Okay, try this, try this link instead. Here's a new link. Does it work? Okay, well, after my talk, um, we will make sure we publicize, um, we'll publicize the link on all our channels. So um, if it's still not working for you all, um, do not fear, we'll send out the link for it. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming to my session. I hope you learn how to make web apps delightful for mobile devices. Um, you can find me on Twitter at L1MES Limes. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the session. There's so much cool stuff coming up. Thanks, everyone.